And, um, so we're, we're in this topic of operability and uh, we finished off some of the stuff last, last class on flexibility. I have uh, one final uh, case study for you uh, that's representative of the sort of questions we typically look around this topic at. And uh, let's put this in context again of your course project. So we've got a stream of naphthalene that we'd like to heat up. And in your flow sheet for the course project, uh, we're doing that inside a fired heater. But let's take a look at perhaps another way we might do this. If we look at the broader context of this plant, there's a number of other heat exchanges we could exchange heat with to heat up this naphthalene stream. And so we might find on other parts of our flow sheet various process streams that we could be doing this on. Right? So these are streams that might be on other parts of the flow sheet that you don't have for your project. What you have for your project is just a portion of the chemical plant. So there are other streams available to us to be exchanging heat with. And um, let's say we find three such hot streams. So these streams are, are hot because we're taking cold naphthalene. And our goal is eventually to get to a high temperature naphthalene. And we may have identified three such heat exchanges um, that can provide some heat for us. So these are hot process streams. So I'll emphasize that this is a process stream, which means that essentially that flow rate, let's call that F2, F3, and F4, we don't get to manipulate those flows. These are from other parts of the process. We have to take those flows as they are. We can't go put valves inside their path. Okay, so so that's my, my, um, my setup over here. I've got a, a temperature measurement, say, and a flow measurement. And my goal is quite simple. I'd like to be able to control this temperature here, T, let's call this T5. So maybe write some additional information here, T5 is much, much greater than T1. We're using those heat exchangers to heat up to that desired temperature. Um, some other information, F2, F3, F4. And even, um, so those are F1, 2, 3, 4 are fixed. We don't get to change those. Let's give some temperature information here. So we've got T2, T3. T4 from that process stream, T2, T3, T4 are disturbances. Okay, so upstream there might be disturbances that upset T2, T3, T4. So we just have to accept whatever heat we get there. We can't guarantee that those temperatures will be any particular value other than some, some range of them, some range of values. And F1 is also a disturbance. Okay. In the sense that our plant operators might set that to a certain value in order to achieve the production rates that are required. Okay. So your goal here is add the necessary flexibility to achieve T5 to be at set point or at some target. Okay, so what do you add to that flow sheet? This is very standard problem. We, we, when we're looking at designing a plant, we see sources of heat. We've got a cold stream we'd like to heat up. Seems perfect combination. We've got these constraints. How do we go add to that process to actually make this work? And it's okay, so take a few minutes, add, add any necessary um, items to that flow sheet, discuss it with someone around you.
No, that's why it's a disturbance. Okay, so the only variable I can manipulate is T1. Can you? T1 is also a disturbance, right? It's whatever your feed temperature of naphthalene is. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, that's what I want you to think about. What are, what are you going to add to the flow sheet to make it work? This guy is overall conceptually. Wouldn't our naphthalene be more of a fixed flow as well? Like it is, but it, it's um, but it's it's down set and varied maybe from week to week depending on your production requirements. Oh, okay. So it does vary. It's a disturbance. Yeah. Can. Yeah. But is that going to control T5 to set point? What's your goal here? Okay, so what are you going to add in the bypass? Okay. But what is your constraints? Can you add a valve a bypass around it? Okay, let's hear some suggestions. There's some good discussion going on. Let's get some thoughts of, of alternatives we can consider here. There's a, there's a number of them, right? There's, um, as you start to see in this course, there's not things that are wrong and right. If things were wrong and right, you'd, we, would, we wouldn't be having this discussion because every flow sheet, we would simply teach you a standard flow sheet and say, always do this. Right, but we don't do that. Where there's a variety of configurations that are always possible and always work and have advantages and disadvantages. So um, let's hear some alternatives and let's talk about them. Suggestions, Helen? A bypass that goes around all three, so perhaps over here and then jump s straight to there. Okay, so there's one option. So a bypass around, and then where's your manipulated variable? Somewhere on this bypass, put a valve and control it to that T5. Okay, so there's, that's one option. Other suggestions? Mark? Um, maybe if you had a sensor between T3 and T4 measuring temperature and then a bypass on T4. Okay, so a bypass around F4 this way? Yeah. Okay. So somewhere here, yeah. and then you're manipulating the flow of, F4. of F. Okay, manipulating the flow of F4, like the, bypass. the bypass flow around F4. Okay, so 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 two suggestions there. One is to bypass in the product stream that we're dealing with, or another option is to bypass around the heat exchanger and bypass the process stream. Okay. So let's just think about what's a potential disadvantage if we uh, bypass 
in this stream. So I'm going to put a control valve here. And bring it back to T5. Oh, sorry, and then putting, adding a, a T, sorry, temperature sensor in between T3 and T4, right after T3. Uh, for which purpose? To see if you're at the temperature that you desire. And then you to okay, so this is the temperature I'm aiming to control. This, t this sensor here would be great for monitoring and making, just checking energy balances. But for control purposes, this is your goal to control T5 to be at the target. So yeah, I definitely recommend adding sensors in between for just monitoring purposes, but your goal is T5. Okay, is that clear? So that, there's one bypass option. The Helen's bypass option was from all the way from the beginning to the end. Other options? Joseph? Three and four. Okay, so mul a, a stage of con uh, three controllers that each bypass around each heat exchanger. Okay, and then a, a, the same set of control loops going. Okay, so a lot more instrumentation then for that option and more piping and valves and sensors. Okay, other suggestions? That's yeah, that's that's acceptable. Yeah, if you wanted that level of detail. Yeah. Okay, so bring, bring the flow back around. Valves on the, okay, so yeah, so recycle is an option. Uh, that's, that's still something I want you to go ahead and we discussed that last class is to try and simulate it in Aspen. Um, so what we've got here essentially uh, is at least this, those three, yeah, another one. Yeah. Then you could just bypass the last one um, on the process stream. Okay, so let's perhaps draw this one in a different color. If you knew that uh, T... You're still going to be less than T5 at that point. Point, yeah. Then you would just bypass that one and and to just control how close you're going. Right, so if as, as drawn, you may overshoot T5 right now. So the suggestion then is to... Um, let's just see what's going on here. Um, the suggestion is to then bypass around here and then tie that into that sensor over there. Right. Okay, so let's take a look at that purple option and then we'll contrast it to the, to the option I drew in. Uh, let me just perhaps draw it in red over here. This option in red was that option. So we've got two, two alternatives. Just give me a second here. Let's do that. Let's deal with this technology. Okay, so this option here in purple is, is yeah, sorry, another suggestion quick before we. Just, um, if you're doing option red, like, and you have, like, feedback in that sense, um, it would, would it be possible to not, like, move your scanner? That's why I was thinking about having the temperature um, in between T3 and T4, and then you have, I guess, more T4. Okay. So you could get to the point. Okay. We'll, we'll definitely talk about feed forward as an option here, yeah. So we've got, um, let's just discuss quickly purple and red. The purple option here se essentially says that at this point we've got enough heat that's still colder than T5, and if we go straight through the heat exchanger, so no bypass, we're going to probably overshoot that temperature at T5. And so what the bypass does is we open and close it to meet target, okay? So if the valve here is fully open, we're mostly, essentially that last 
heat exchanger becomes useless or redundant if that valve here is fully open. The fluid is going to take the path of least resistance and pass through there. And if that valve is fully closed, essentially we're sending everything through the heat exchanger. So, that give, so where I'm going with that discussion is like Helen suggested actually originally to bypass right from over here. Okay. You could bypass from this point, from that point, any number one of those, of those points. The choice would be dependent on the energy balances and the actual temperatures that are observed there. Right, so if you really needed a wide range of control, this first takeoff here would give you a broader range because you could bypass all your heat exchangers. So you get a really wide range of temperatures that you could achieve here at T5. So it absolutely is valid. It just depends on how flexible, how big you want that operating window at T5 to be. With this configuration from Helen coming down first over here and then all the way across, I could go to ex basically bypass all the heat exchangers and, um, and I could go, when this valve here is fully closed, I'm using all three heat exchangers. So it's a tremendously flexible range. The drawing here in red, um, just let me just complete the rest of the red part, essentially bypasses the heat coming from the process stream. What that does is if I open this valve over here, let's say that valve is fully open, I'm essentially not exchanging heat with the process stream. But what I then do is that whatever this temperature is coming out over here, this flow F4 comes in at temperature T4, and it's going to leave at some colder temperature. What I'm essentially doing is I'm going to, when I open and close that valve there, I'm going to be creating disturbances on another part of my process, unrelated to me. Okay? So I'm, I'm using this hot stream coming in. I'm going to take some heat away from it. But with this red bypass, I'm going to upset that stream as well in terms of if this flow and temperature are used elsewhere, I'm going to create a new disturbance for that process then to be dealing with. Okay? So I'm propagating my disturbances onto other parts of the flow sheet. Whereas the purple bypass, I'm not affecting and creating those disturbances too much. Okay? I'm still going to vary this temperature coming out here by having the purple bypass, but it's not going to be as dramatic. Okay? And it's, it, I'm containing the disturbances mostly to myself, to my region of the flow sheet. Okay. Sean? When is the disturbance to your fixed flow? In that sense, be very minimal though? Sorry? For like It's not a disturbance to the flow at all. The F4 here is the same as the F4 there. It's a disturbance to the temperature. Well, we'd have disturbance to temperatures in the, in the standard setup anyway. Less so, though. So the effect on that T is going to be much, much less, right? Because look, I'm taking three exchanges. I'm going to be using up a lot of heat to achieve my goal T5, right? So it indicates that a lot of the, the heat is going to be taken from there. Right. what we actually need to do with that downstream. It will be very much dependent on that. And again, the choice of which exchanger to bypass could be adjusted if that temperature down here is really sensitive, you would then bypass around the, the one that's got least requirements. Rachel? Um, the bypass pieces would be fairly short. So yeah, and you'd insulate them as well. Okay. So the, this, uh, as you've seen here, there's at least four or five options that we could consider, depending, and a lot, a lot of the choice you make would depend on some of the other constraints that you have in the process, right? I've written a few constraints over here. I'm glad that none of you have chosen to manipulate flows F1 or F2, F3, F4 directly, right? So those, we cannot manipulate. Um, those flows are fixed for F2, 3, and 4, and F1 is a flow we have to accept that comes from upstream, right? So we have to resort to this bypass. Um, I also want you now to, let's take uh, this idea, and I want to transition to the next topic.
Again, I'm going to talk about heat exchangers and we're going to look at temperature propagation. So consider this diagram. I'm going to And we're taking a feed here, a cold feed, and I'm going to send this feed, this feed needs to be heated up, I'll, I'll talk about the heating in a minute. Um, we're going to send it to a packed bed reactor. It's exothermic. So that pack bed reactor, the material leaving is very hot. And the moment we see a hot stream and a cold stream that needs to be heated, we might decide to cross them and exchange heat over them. OK, so we've seen this, uh, this principle. Uh, you might have seen this in other courses before where you preheat your feed, this idea of preheating. And what I'd like you to consider on that diagram is how are you going to start up that process? So every course you've ever taken says it's at steady state, and it's been easy to solve those equations. But now we're going to take it a step forward, and I'm going to ask you, starting from totally cold, nothing's flowing, what are the sequence of steps you're going to follow in order to make that, that work, okay? So think about that for a minute and then uh, we'll take up some discussion. it will be the part of least resistance. So there's definitely going to be some flow. Right. So could you have another valve here that closes in response to this one opening? Yeah, you could um, create a more sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ratio control mm -hmm. is very common. Uh, so like think of just even the reflux ratio in a distillation column. Right. That's a standard okay. classic uh, two I was, valves. I was just wondering because if you have T1 for some reason, you know, really high, like at T5 already, yeah. right, you would want to bypass everything A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so if for some reason your inlet came in at the right temperature already, you'd want 100% yeah. yeah. bypass. Yeah. Yeah. It's unlikely, but it's, yeah. it's possible, yeah. yeah. You have to. Okay, so for that reaction to work, you have to heat the feed up. So the cold feed will actually not react and, and not do anything. So you have to preheat the feed. Suggestions, Dario? Yeah. Just tell me where. Okay. Right. Okay, so any suggestions? Yeah. Mark? Um, like have a furnace that heats the steam and then go ahead and do um, the steam heat, but then you could like turn on the steam heat. Um, you could 
Okay, so I have a furnace somewhere. And what are we going to do with the furnace? Okay, so I'm just going to draw that as steam coming in. How, how am I going to preheat the cold stream? Okay, so put the steam in over here. And let it. Oh, okay. Okay. So, a, so a separate heat exchanger going on your cold feed. So, uh, let's. So over there, say, and then. Okay, so steam, we commonly have a boiler house on our site in, in larger processes. So that heat exchanger is fed only by steam, creates condensate, and it's used over there. Any, any other details around that heat exchanger? Any other suggestions as well? There was some others here. Yeah, Sean? I thought it was a similar thing. Like a, so we can draw just to the valve on the steam in the there. And okay. Okay, so uh, Sean's taking it, uh, adding on a little bit more information here for us. So, planning to put a valve here and then make that uh, TC2. to manipulate that steam. So when it gets to the right temperature, it may then close that valve fully shut because now TC2 is at the right inlet temperature for the reactor and the reactor is then providing the heat. So as this reactor is coming online and the exothermic uh, reaction is taking place and we're heating up this material, as this gets to the right temperature, we're exchanging heat and this valve is eventually going to close and close using less steam so we rely less on that external heat exchanger to, to preheat the process. Okay. Other, other suggestions? Okay, so, yeah, sorry, Michelle. Okay, so have this line steam traced and use that steam around the line to preheat. So it's like, it's, it is another heat exchanger essentially, it's just a steam trace around the line, if it provides the, the necessary temperature to, to get it up there, okay? So there's that option. Now, that solves the startup option. So now we're running and we're going fine now I'd like you to think about disturbances that come in. What will happen, let's, we're assuming we're at steady state, okay? So this is the diagram as is for startup. We're at steady state now, we've started up, and this feed coming from some other part of the flow sheet now comes at a higher flow rate. So the flow rate increases by 20%, say. Okay, what's What's going to happen on that diagram and what are we going to need to do? So feed comes in at 20% more. I want you to think about this, like talk about the logic of every single step and follow, follow the flow sheet through and see what's going to happen when the feed flow comes in at 20% more. So that's your disturbance. Uh, could be that, it could be, could be something like that. But yeah, you have to now deal with this extra.
Okay, so um, what, what, uh, what chain of events is going to take place with that disturbance? So bypass around there, okay. So that's correct. We've got everyone understand the runaway reaction taking place here, okay. We know we're comfortable with feedback control. Remember back to 3P that we need negative feedback control, right? And we implement negative feedback control by selecting our controller gain KC to have the, op to have the same sign as the process gain that we're controlling so that we get that enforced built-in negative feedback control. But here, this flow sheet, this is not a control system, but this flow sheet is exactly got the same structure as a feedback flow diagram from 3P. Okay? And what's happening is you're reinforcing the events that are happening there in a positive way with the wrong sign, the wrong direction. Okay? It would be fine if the system was intrinsically safe and would cool itself down if that disturbance occurred, but this is the opposite case. When we get this increased flow, we're getting more temperature, more heat, and it's being circulated and it's causing the problem to, to grow. So the suggestion then is to bypass around here. So that you avoid exchanging heat with that incoming stream and you would then add a valve so what bypass flow do you need would come into TC2 okay so this this orange loop over here for steam is gone away we've started up the reactor we don't need that control loop anymore so that control loop disappears so once the process is up and running we switch our control loop same sensor or group of sensors, because we would never control this important temperature sensor just on one sensor. Dr. Marlin mentioned reliability. We would have a duplicate or th even three sensors where we vote, take the vote from two out of the three sensors. Right? So that same bank of sensors then is used to manipulate the bypass flow around the heat exchanger. Okay. You could also Another alternative is uh, the bypass was around this hot stream. You could also bypass the feed. So I could have, uh, let's draw it here in green, I could have bypassed around here. Okay. And then put a valve and controlled it on TC2 as well. So with this bypass, you've got two options. Now, there is also this idea that if this heat exchanger that you had over here was not providing the sufficient heat to preheat your feed, so T1 is heated up to T2, but it doesn't, it's not quite the right amount of heat. It's not providing enough heat, even at steady state. You would then have both heat exchangers, this heat exchanger and the steam heat exchanger, and the steam just provides and makes up the balance. Okay, so it tops up the balance of your heat required. And so what we get essentially, and then you're going to see this in the operability topic, is that heat exchanger that we've added here for startup not only benefits us to start up the process, it also benefits us from a control and a flexibility point of view because we can now go make up additional heat with that same heat exchanger. You haven't just bought a heat exchanger that gets used for a few hours once a year when you're starting up your process you now get to use that heat exchanger um, to provide the necessary makeup heat as well, if needed. Okay. So I want you to go back and look at your flow diagrams for the course project and see where you can apply this learning from today's class. Um, some other things that we would, we would add to this diagram that are not shown here are all the shuttle valves to take this out of maintenance and, and to do cleaning, right? Um, particularly on this diagram, you may decide 
halfway through the year while your process is operating that you need to take this heat exchanger out and do repairs on it. So you need, what you would need here is essentially a bypass around the heat exchanger that way and a bypass around the heat exchanger this way with the necessary shutoff valves. So there would be at least six valves drawn on top of there. The, the drawings are just going to get messy um, if I add them in for you now to take that heat exchanger out of maintenance but still keep the process running. Absolutely. So again, here's an example of where this bypass that was added for control now also benefits you for a, a shut or for a temporary um, maintenance procedure. These valves can be used to isolate the heat exchanger, the same valves used to isolate the heat exchanger for maintenance purposes. Okay. So it's a very, very common theme in this topic is that one change that you make for a particular reason also has two or three other repercussions that work favorably for you. Yeah. Okay, so good question. If I had to take this heat exchanger out for maintenance and this first and the third heat exchanger still don't provide enough heat for you, right, to get you to T5, that indicates that you can't take that exchanger out of maintenance as shown on the diagram. If you really had to take the exchanger out, of maintenance, out to do maintenance and not shut the process down, you would need a makeup heat exchanger over here similar to the idea that we used there. Okay, so what this, uh, what, I've, what this topic has done over here on this diagram is given you an idea for what a very important part of our process operations are related to startup and shutdown. Most of the accidents in a chemical plant occur during that very short period of time. Okay, it is unfortunate that that's the case and the reasons for it are several, but one of the primary reasons are of course, startup and shutdown is not something that's done frequently. So the procedures for doing that are often not thought out very carefully. Um, as you even saw in our discussion today, there's, there's, there's several ways that we can make this work, right? And everyone might, every, you get a group of five engineers around the table, you'll have five different ideas that are all seemingly right to get this process working. So I, I can't emphasize this enough. Startup and shutdown is an important part of an operation. It's the most, uh, most problematic time in terms of safety incidents. And so careful thought needs to go into the sequence that you follow during startup and shutdown. And most often, you have to involve operators and experts to get that right. Okay, so the, these are not, uh, are not things that you should take lightly. Um, we're very comfortable as engineers thinking steady state and continuous operations, but um, that idea of bringing up a process from very cold to its operating temperature is something that pushes the process into regions that are far outside if it, of its typical operating window. And there's often consequences that are not anticipated, um, which is where those safety um, incidents occur. Okay, so, so please bear that in mind uh, during, during your career. Now, I wanted to move on next to um, this idea of, again, related to sequencing up flow sheets and considering time periods where things are varying dramatically. And related to that is this idea of the interface between a batch process and a continuous process. So in many processes, we have essentially um, a multitude of steps. They might be recycled back here. But this part, let's assume here in white, is continuous. And then we get to a batch reactor, where that material is fed into a batch reactor. We run the batch for a period of time. And the batch is drained 
and then is continuously processed downstream. So let's, uh, let's at the simplest example, just use a single separator that follows the batch. Okay, and we're separating that batch product into two streams. So we've got a continuous process up front, a batch in the middle, and a continuous process after. To make this process work, how, how are we going to add things? What are we going to need in addition to what I've drawn there to make that successfully operable? Storage vessels, one or more? More? Where would I, we pl place them? Okay, so before the batch reactor and after the batch. Okay, so before the batch reactor, I would need a storage vessel added. and after the batch reactor. And the storage afterwards is often the important one. It needs to be at least as big as the batch itself because we typically empty that entire batch. So, so this store over here needs to be able to take the full volume of the batch reactor. It's moved from there into the storage and then downstream I can now continuously operate my separator after that storage unit. Okay. And typically that, that storage afterwards is the size of your batch reactor plus more. Because what we want to do is, we, once this batch is finished, we're going to transfer the fluid over into the store and then clean my batch. There's often a cleaning process that takes place on the batch reactor. That's going to take up some time. And while that batch is being cleaned, I'm still consuming the material in my store. So you need to be able to um, hold not only the batch but, but a bit more than that um, to modulate that disturbance. Okay, so this is not uncommon. We often see the batch process stuck in the middle of a continuous part on either side. Okay, so that's another important point re related to operability. Because what we can, uh, well, yeah, the first one would need to be. Um, at least, let's say, where, the way I'm going with this is consider a, a batch that's run as a fed batch operation, where during the batch you're still feeding into, into the tank. So that's, that's common in polymer processing. If it was a pure batch process where you need to fill the tank and then shut it and then run the reaction duration, yes, then your pre-storage would need to be as big as well. Okay, but if it's a fed batch stage, you can get away with a smaller store. And again, storage is related to inventory costs um, that Dr. Marlin spoke about in the last class. Um, another topic related to that is something that you may, uh, if, for those of you that have taken 4M, we'll see this topic coming up in 4M. But for those of you that have taken it already, um, we often have this sort of system Uh, these are supposed to be the same size, sorry, there, uh, of absorbers. So an absorber is, um, I've got an example here. So these breeder water filters are an example of an absorber. So you use these at home to absorb impurities out of the water stream. Um, so in an industrial case, you have large beds of these. So big, big cylindrical containers of absorbers. And the interesting thing about absorbers is you can always reverse them. So you can desorb the material that's absorbed onto the surface. So in an industrial process, we'll have your feed plus contaminants come in. And what we'll do is we will close one of these valves over here. So shut this and keep this one open. And essentially, we're only using, let's call this bed one and bed two. We're only using bed two to absorb our contaminants. And leaving out here is the purified feed. Okay. So I can, I can run that process in that way. And you would put um, a one-way 
valve over there to prevent backflow in the same way we saw that earlier with pumps and motors. So I'm absorbing onto one bed and then when that bed is fully loaded, so we can't put any more contaminants onto the bed anymore, um, I would close this valve over here and then open that valve and then use bed one. And then while bed one is being operated, I regenerate bed two. So typically regeneration is done by running steam through the bed or you heat the bed up in some way to desorb the contaminants and you deal with the contaminant elsewhere. Okay? So we're always alternating then between the two beds in that way. There's an example again of transition that's added to a process. The process is going to transition from one bed to the other bed and um, the control systems on these are fairly sophisticated to do that in an automat automatic way. But again, what you see here that this, um, this parallel sort of uh, feature that you will often see in flow sheets isn't necessarily for reliability or redundancy. Here it's for a different reason. It's so that we can continually operate my process. So here's a continuous feed. And here's a continuous outlet stream. But this piece here in the middle is, is batch. Okay? So it's another example of that sort of idea of continuous, batch, continuous. Except this is a little bit different to what you've seen before because this batch process isn't like a typical batch reactor. What happens in this packed bed reactor is the contaminants build up here and eventually that gets to a point where your contaminants start to leak out and at that moment you decide to shut the bed and you alternate to the other one. And then regeneration is you're simply reversing this contaminant off the, off the bed and reusing it. Okay, so continuous batch, continuous appears fairly frequently on a flow sheet. Yeah. Did you ever see anything in like a membrane? Any, um, in many processes, we see this idea reoccurring. So you, here I've drawn it for adsorbents, but you will see this for membranes, for fouling. So you'll switch between one membrane um, to another and regenerate. Uh, we'll see this in catalyst deactivation. So many catalysts can be regenerated. Um, so you'll take your deactivated catalyst bed regenerate it and reuse it again. So heat exchangers. You c this is actually no different to having a parallel heat exchanger and then while it's being cleaned you can switch to another heat exchanger. Okay? Except for heat exchangers that's really expensive to, to be doing that. But I mean this idea of taking your feed, splitting it and running um, a subset of the units is reoccurs. Um, in the course notes that you have from the website, you'll see this for uh, cracking. Ethylene cracking is an example that I've given you there. Um, companies every 40 days or so will regenerate the, the cracking unit. Okay, so we'll continue on a little bit with this next week and uh, also then move on to the safety topic next. <laughs>